The interview with Hugh Hewitt today is with General Stanley McChrystal, a retired United States Army General. Good morning. Good to see you again. It's good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I want to begin by giving you my condolences on the loss of your colleague and classmate, General Ordierno. I assume you guys spent a lot of time together over the course of as many decades as you spent in the United States Army. We did. He was a great soldier, and more importantly, he was a great human being. So my thoughts to his family but also to all his friends. Now, General, we're here to talk about this, Risk, a user's guide. Uh, your brand new book, along with Anna Budrico. I've had you on before twice to talk about my share of the task and team of teams, and then to talk about leaders. It seemed, first of all, I listened to half this book. I have never listened to you narrate before. Had you narrated either of the prior books? I had done just the introduction to the prior books. This is the first time I did the whole book. Well, when I get a book on Thursday and I'm doing an interview on Monday, I end up reading from the beginning and then taking the last third and listening during my hour-long trundles on uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You're very good at this, but how did you like the audio book experience? <laughs> I didn't think I was very good. I mean, obviously, you sit in a little booth, and when you read your own work, the problem is you go, boy, I should have written that better. Because when you read it out loud, you, you kick yourself. So I wanted to rewrite the book while I was in the booth, but it was a little late. A little late. I also, you also find uh, little tiny errors. I don't know if that is what you also encountered, but uh, my hat's off to you. It's a very good read. Most people are not very good. They should leave it to professionals. Here's a very good read. Let's talk about this book. Your first book, or the one that I brought to people's attention the most, Team of Teams, impacted how I did business. I think Risk is really a C-suite book for executives, people in the executive suite. I also think it's for MBAs who are rising and uh, the consulting community, but it's also for moms who have to decide whether or not to let their kids walk to school by themselves. It's actually for everyone who has to assess and make decisions based upon risk. Fair summary, General? Well, that was our goal. We wanted to make it approachable for everyone and not a scientific study. And so I hope we've done that. You've done very well, but it, we've got to begin by explaining what the risk immune system is. Before I get the specific questions, why don't you give the overview of what you've decided to call the risk immune system? Absolutely. We, we had an experience with risk. Everybody does through a lifetime. I had much more than my co-author and it because I'm much older. But the reality was I had come to the conclusion that we don't handle risk very well. So I wanted to study it and see what we could make of it. And we came to the conclusion that the greatest risk to us is in fact us. It is not the threats out there because many of them are impossible to predict and they really aren't as 10 feet tall and dangerous as we want to pretend they are. It's our own weakness, our vulnerabilities. And so I had done some work with a Yale immunologist, Christina Talbert Slagle, a few years ago. And it, it struck me that the human immune system is a pretty interesting analogy what we have to do with risk. And here's what I mean. Every day, the human body is attacked by an estimated 10,000 microorganisms, threats, any one of which could make us sick or kill us. And yet, we don't get up in the morning worried about it. You and I don't say, I wonder how my risk immune system, or my human immune system is today. Because it just seemingly effortlessly detects those risks, those threats, it assesses each to see if it's dangerous to us. It responds, typically by destroying them if necessary. And then it learns in the process, so it's smarter next time and more efficient. And so this detect, assess, respond, learn cycle protects us. And the only time we have to worry about it is when our immune system is weakened for some reason, autoimmune deficiency, or we're sick, or, or something else. Well, if you think about organizations and a society as just a big organization, when its risk immune system is weakened, it becomes vulnerable to things which really shouldn't be a huge threat to us. It shouldn't pose a great risk. If we think about risk, in fact, as the mathematical function between risks and vulnerabilities, or threats times vulnerabilities, threat times vulnerability equals risk, and you have no threats, you live in a world, a perfect world, where nothing's out to get you, then that would be zero. So anything times zero is zero. So your risk is zero, but we don't live in that world. And so you look at our vulnerabilities and we say, well, if we could drive our vulnerabilities down to zero, that would be great. And we probably can't do that, but we, we have great control agency over those. 
And so our ability exists to take what we've defined as 10 risk control factors, communication, narrative, timing, action, diversity, bias, adaptability, leadership, and so on, and make those elements as healthy as possible, both individually and then as a system, then no matter what the threat is, we are better positioned to deal with it. You know- No, I don't want, I, I don't want to preempt the, uh, the particular discussion. I want to go through each of the factors with you, General. But what I want people to understand, the reason they want to get risk, is if your risk immune system is off, in other words, if you are poorly calculating whatever risk you're attempting to assess, Either you're going to live life in fear or you're not going to live life at all. You've got to get it right or you won't be able to be productive. If you're over-cautious or under-cautious, both, and there's a spectrum in which you can operate that is comfortable and smart. But if you over-prevent or you under-prevent, you're at risk. That, that's right. And you call me Stan, please. <laughs> not going to happen, General, but go ahead. Uh, so, so when you got Anna to sit down with you on this, and she's a young person, did she have the same understanding of risk uh, that not because of age, but because you're being military, she wasn't military. Did you have different ecosystems of risk when you came together? Very different. And that made it very healthy because in many cases I saw threats and things that she didn't. I also saw gray areas that life teaches you. You know, you, you sort of have this binary view when you're young, when things are a little bit simpler and you say this or this, and then life tells you it's never that simple. And so we came at it very differently. And that was important because we had these dialectic conversations as we try to figure out what reality is. You know, I, I, I particularly appreciate it, General. The story you told, and I want to check up on your recovery at the beginning of the book, you had spine surgery. Now, there's a bell curve in everything, literally everything. There's a 10% great and a 10% awful, and most of the stuff occurs in the 80%. You managed to pull the spine surgery that is ordinarily a very routine and not have the greatest one ever, but have one at the wrong end of the bell curve. So how are you doing on recovering from that? Yeah, I'm doing great after five spine surgeries. Um, oh, what God. happened? I had two earlier in my life, just, you know, beat up and issues. And then in the spring or the fall of 2019, the surgeon told me I needed to get most of my spine fused. And I had put it off as long as I could. But I went to a world-class guy uh, up at uh, New York Presbyterian in New York City. So, and he had done, he had actually uh, operated on the son of a friend of mine who was a great football player. And so we had a great outcome. So I had him do it. A month after that, had big complications, had to go back in, and they had to basically do it again. And then a month after that, they had to go back in and do it again. And so in the course of three months, I had three spine surgeries. And, you know, he had briefed me at the, at the outset. He says, you know, in a tiny percentage of cases, something can go wrong. And if you're like me, I said, well, I'm never in the tiny percentage. I never win the lottery. So what could, what could go wrong? But it's a great illustration of actually understanding the risk pattern that presented itself to you and still getting blindsided because you can't get rid of risk. You did the smart thing. You prepared as best you can. You still got hit. This is not a guide to invulnerability. I think that's the lesson I took away from it. You can do all this and you're still not going to be invulnerable to risk. I also want to thank you because I've driven by the Braddock Canyon probably a thousand times in my life. Now, I never run up Braddock. When I'm running in Northern Virginia, I stay on the lowlands by the river. You run up the hill. I, I compliment you on that. You're faster than I am. You've actually passed me a couple of times on the pathways. But that Braddock Canyon, I had no idea that was a Braddock Canyon, nor that you would hold up Braddock as a, an example, in this case, an example not to follow. Tell us about Braddock. It's so great. I had grown up on the story of General Edward Braddock when I was young, and you and I both lived very close to the home where he actually planned his expedition. And Braddock was a major general in the British Army who was told to go capture Fort Duquesne, which is where modern Pittsburgh is. And so to get from Alexandria, Virginia to Fort Duquesne was a long and most of it a very difficult journey. So he puts together this force two regiments of which are British regulars, and then he's got some American militia, and then he's got a bunch of contract logisticians, meaning he's buying uh, 
both transportation and supplies from local suppliers, which was really difficult. They were, they were pretty sketchy, actually. So he puts this thing together, and he's going against a French fort, but largely uh, against a threat that was American, Native Americans, American Indian tribes led by the French. And he had been warned before the expedition, hey, this is different. You're going into different terrain against a different kind of enemy. You got to approach this in a different way. But Braddock had a certain arrogance to him. He was not incompetent, but he didn't listen. He didn't take in those warnings from other people. And he put together this expedition that goes forward. It has all kinds of problems uh, logistically. He's got young George Washington as an aide de camp. He's got young Daniel Boone driving one of his wagons. Uh, but they get there, and they ha end up having a meeting engagement with the French and Indians, and they get badly defeated. And it was because he didn't adapt to the conditions. And it was almost a classic case of somebody who has the confidence that comes from knowing something, but the vulnerability in that knowing what they know is inappropriate for the situation they're in. Now, I, that comes out of your discussion of diversity, and I want the audience to understand when General McChrystal talks about the need for diversity in a decision-making unit, it is not the diversity that drives most of the political arguments of today or the politically correct argument or the CRT argument. It is diversity of points of view and life experience. General Braddock did not absorb the George Washington proffered experience on fighting in the backwoods with the tribes, and as a result, he lost badly. When you encourage diversity, it's actually the sort of diversity I wish college campuses would more broadly embrace and law school faculties, of which I've been a member, which is diversity of worldviews, experience, and outlooks, because that will strengthen a risk assessment. Am I right about that, General? That's exactly right. We get very superficial on diversity. And as I put in the book, we confuse diversity with equal, equality of opportunity. And I think equality of opportunity is a legal right and it's a moral right, and we should do it. But that's not why organizations should do it. Organizations, as you say, need different perspectives and experience where they're going to have blind spots. Uh, General, you did a lot of, you enlightened me to Crimson Contagion, which was a uh, risk assessment study run about pandemic. I had heard about it a little bit because I've been fairly close to the pandemic team that was under President Trump and know a couple of people on the pandemic team under President Biden, and I followed it obsessively. I used to warn about it obsessively in January of 2020 to the, to the detriment of my audience. They thought I was nuts. I went back after reading Risk and got the Crimson Contagion, uh, Contagion case study out. I read it, 74 pages, I think. And it was issued by the Assistant Secretary of Health. Indeed, it did have the master control team, the master control cells, the HHS simulation cell. But on page 46, I found this. I'd love your reaction to this. During the exercise, a significant topic of concern centered around the inadequacies of existing executive branch and statutory authorities to provide Health and Human Services Department with the requisite mechanisms to serve successfully as the lead federal agency in response to an influenza pandemic. Exercise participants highlighted the need to codify policies and procedures for HHS to lead, direct, and source funding in response to all kinds of public health emergencies. So at the end of the risk assessment, which I wish had been taken seriously, they came up with the conclusion that we need more money and authority. Doesn't that undo the whole purpose of a risk assessment to come back and say, we're the answer that you need? <laughs> well, it doesn't if they act on it. I mean, I'm actually surprised Crimson Contagion has gotten as little press coverage as it has, because as you saw, the scenario was remarkably similar to what played out in COVID-19. And the problems were remarkably clearly identified. And I realized it was only a few months before COVID-19, but this isn't a new problem. We've been struggling to get ourselves more prepared for these kinds of threats for a long time. And so I am very critical of people who shelved this thing and didn't take action. Yeah. Do you think it would have been better? I, well, I, I took a big lesson away from this, which is, the effectiveness of a risk assessment is going to be proportional to the seriousness with which it is taken by senior leadership, and senior leadership will not take it seriously unless they are actively involved in it. Fair conclusion? 
absolutely the case. We used to find if we do tabletop exercises or war games in the military, and if senior leaders aren't involved, then it becomes just sort of a briefing they get later. If they are involved, it's visceral to them. And, and I, I read with great interest, because I've got a friend in the war gaming business who cannot get members of Congress to do a war game about Taiwan. And the reason they cannot do so is that the members of Congress don't have the clearances necessary to participate in a war game involving the aggression against Taiwan. How crazy is that system, General McChrystal? Well, I think you would need to fix that because I don't think that's the only reason they don't do it. I think there's a desire on some people to be a step away because if you're ignorant, you can say, I wasn't involved, and then you can criticize from the sidelines. If you get up close to something, you get a certain amount of responsibility because of that. But that's what we elect people for, to have that responsibility. And so I think it ought to be required because in the middle of particularly a Taiwan crisis, it's going to be very, very dangerous. And what we don't need is people who don't understand what's happening or don't understand what the, the different options are saying it. Yeah, your, your colleague and friend, Admiral Stavridis, is a regular guest on the show. And his new book, 2034, is about how a Taiwan war can start very, very quickly. And I just can't believe we're not running the right risk. If I can go back to COVID, General, every single American, indeed every citizen of the world, is impacted by COVID. To a lesser or greater extent, and I can tell from Risk, a user guide, your new book, that you've studied it quite closely. I've studied it quite closely. I want to run through some of the big errors as we do a kind of after action report on the first year and a half. Number one error is the politicization of the crisis. I don't know how this could have been avoided, but I, I'm wondering what your response is to my assessment of the number one problem with the COVID response, politicization. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd say it's number one, but I put it right up there. And I think there's a lot of people guilty for that. Not, not, you can't pin that on a single person. You gotta pin that on a system that includes the media, that includes political leaders, and, and then others from the sidelines as well. I agree. Number two, uh, early on the CDC took unto itself the authority to develop a test to diagnose, they rejected the WHO test, they rejected industry tests, and then they blew the test. So they created a bottleneck on an essential ingredient early enough. Now, the CDC had a huge Q rating until this pandemic. Everyone reposed confidence in the CDC. That's shattered now. Do you think a long period of success makes a risk assessment even more urgent than perhaps repeated failure? Yeah, I think so. And in the case of the CDC, everybody's going to have failures. I think the problem with the CDC failure, and they did, they just they swung and missed at that one. But there was also a communications failure because I don't think that the American people were informed, okay, we've made this decision, we're trying this, and oh, it didn't work, okay, we're gonna try something else. I think they could have saved a lot of their credibility had it been very clearly explained in real time. Let me follow up on that. Dr. Fauci was my guest two weeks ago. He's been a number of times on this program. I'm a big proponent of vaccine. I've already got my booster. I hope you have as well, General, if you're in the right category for that. Uh, I think you are. You and I are both in the right category for that. The Dr. Fauci and I discussed the problem of the noble lie. Early on in the COVID crisis, the Trump administration with Dr. Fauci's um, uh, agreement, indeed, I think he pushed it, told the American people masks were ineffective and they did not need to get them. That recommendation came out of the public health bureaucracy because they were afraid of a run on masks uh, and doctors not being able to get masks and hoarding occurring. I think it was a terrifically tragic mistake. What do you think of a noble lie communication strategy? Yeah, I think it's very, very dangerous and it almost never works out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie it to some other things in life. You know, often we talk about the generals in Afghanistan lying to the American people or, you know, uh, in a very difficult financial crisis, a senior leader going up and saying, okay, the, the markets are sound and whatnot when in fact they may not be. The danger with that is you, have an, you are desiring to calm people, but as soon as the, uh, the lack of honesty is known, you've undercut everything. And so I think you've got to understand that certain people in certain roles are going to have to say certain things or are going to say certain things. 
And the public has got to be mature enough to say, okay, the person who's saying the bank is sound, everything's fine, has a reason they're saying that. So the public's got to be smart enough to, to take that and nuance it a bit. But in the case of something like this, where we, I think we undercut long-term credibility very, very badly. I think the American people can take honesty. I think they could have stood up in front of people and said, here's what we don't know. We don't know if masks are essential. We think they might be because in previous viral, you know, pandemics like this, they have been, but we don't have enough masks right now. So here's what we're gonna tell you, but stay tuned. We're gonna tell you everything we know as fast as we know it. And sometimes what we tell you will be wrong until we, you know, we're gonna correct it as we get more information. I think that kind of transparency would have been, would have set a completely different stage for our response to COVID-19. Now, we are not at the end of the virus, so we can't have an after action report, but we could have a hot wash right now of what we've done to date. I first heard the term hot wash when a, a retired SEAL, Brian Ferguson, gave a little speech on it, and I was so, he did it in 15 minutes. That was the format. I thought that's the greatest idea I've ever heard of. You talk about both hot washes and after action assessments throughout Risk, the new book that you've written with Anna. Can you distinguish for the uh, radio audience and the, and the podcast audience the difference between a hot wash and an after action report? Absolutely, Hugh. We would do a combat operation and you would literally land back in the aircraft and you would assemble somewhere and do what we call a hot wash because things were still hot. It was really important to do that because one, memories didn't fade, people hadn't gotten together and talked to other people and changed their, uh, their perception of certain events and there were still emotions to things. So if somebody didn't do something the way you wanted them to do, that emotion was good because you table it, boom. And so it's a good chance to, to get information quickly, also to act on it. If, it. if you've got a real challenge, you sometimes need to act right away. An after action review comes typically a few days later and you've had a chance to assemble everybody, they're rested, they're not emotional anymore. You, you can organize a space for it and you can go through a very systematic, first you review what happened and you try to get a clear recording of what actually transpired. And it takes all the different participants to fill in that. And then from there you say, okay, what do we need to do better next time? And those are the lessons learned. And, and an after action review, as we call it, is uh, critical, but it's not that immediate flash to bang that a hot wash is. Now, there are three major events in recent American history that would deserve either or both of a hot wash or an after action event. One is COVID, which is, I guess, we're not at the beginning of the end, but we're at the end of the beginning here. There might be an Omega variant. There might be all sorts of things out there, but we have enough to study. Number two is January 6th, the insurrection and the occupation of the Capitol by rioters. And number three is the collapse in Afghanistan. From your perspective of advising the private sector from the McChrystal Group on when to do risk uh, assessments and when to do after action reports, et cetera, which of those three would you tackle first and which of those three deserve one or both of the hot wash or after acting uh, uh, report? Yeah, I think all make sense to study. I think COVID-19 really needs to be studied now. I think we need a COVID-19 commission like the 9-11 commission. I do think that there are some very near-term lessons learned that a hot wash would do. And we could probably clear the air on a number of things because there's still a bit of misperception and whatnot. But I think you need to put a commission on this one that will take a, a couple of years probably to get to the bottom of it and produce a roadmap that really puts pressure on the federal and state and local governments to make some changes so we're, we're better postured for next time. For January 6th, the problem with that is the emotions ran so high in the moment that the hot wash started being political within hours after the event. Yes. And, and the hot wash occurred on media. It didn't occur with a group of people in a room. And, and you almost lost that moment because you saw there was people had a certain feeling and then six, 12 hours later, they were already posturing for something else. And so now I do think you need to have a study of that but I am concerned that you're gonna be able to get a study that is free enough of politics that you can really learn from it. I think you can probably get a tactical one, say we need barriers and police net here. The real issue is what happened in terms of fomenting that 
what brought those groups together, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'm, I think it needs to happen, but I have lower expectations of the outcome of that for the politics. For Afghanistan, I don't think it will tell us as much as we think it will. I think what we'll find is that we had a long-term commitment in Afghanistan. We made a decision first under President Trump to sign the Doha Accords and then President Biden to follow through on that, uh, to completely pull out. And so there's that decision and you know there are opinions whether that was a good one or bad one, I would recommend to differ. But bottom line is they made that decision. Then the actual uh, pullout, I think what we're gonna find is they looked at a range of options, they selected one that they thought would be as quick as it could be, and therefore lower risk to the force. I think they just got it wrong on how fast the Taliban would be able to move. And so I'm not saying that it was, uh, it was understandable in my view that, that I, they I, got that wrong. I, I don't actually want you to pine on because I think there's going to be an Afghanistan commission. It's in the NDA as it passed out of the House. I hope they call you up and ask you to serve on that, General, because there are very few people who will have credibility with every community when it comes time to do an after-action assessment. One of the things that will come up is the failure of intelligence. You talk about the failure of intelligence prior to 9-11, and you also talk about the failure of intelligence prior to Pearl Harbor. Uh, you have a family story to Pearl Harbor, which made me laugh because my wife's grandfather, the guy named uh, Admiral Joe Tossig, who warned about Pearl Harbor and FDR fired him. You had, what, a cousin running around Pearl Harbor who, dis who disappeared, Latimer, Commander Latimer? Yeah, um, much older than me, obviously. He was a class of 1914 out of the Naval Academy. And I remember being told the story in 1965 when I saw this picture of him. And the story it was told is he was stationed at Pearl Harbor commanding the USS Dobbin, and he was a 51-year-old Navy commander, and he liked to go hiking. And so he went hiking and disappeared. Never found, no trace at all. Now, the first time I heard this story, it was uh, related to me as it was like right on the eve of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was actually in July of 1941, so several months before. But still, he went right above Pearl Harbor, and that's tough terrain, but not really tough terrain. And so for him to disappear, his crew looked for him and the local authorities did, they never found anything. And of course, after the December 7th attack, immediately it was opined that he had been found by Japanese spies or something. Of course, we never know. But it's a fascinating anecdote about uh, surrounding anecdotal evidence with myth and surrounding it with probability. That's what risk sometimes if you, if you don't get the good information, you're at risk. And if you get bad information, you're at risk. One of the th risk factors that you talked about is the breakdown of communications in modern America. Actually, it's not the breakdown. It's the uh, siloing of information. It's become partisan. Every single platform is partisan, General. I, I don't know if you agree with me about that, but I believe they are all, my show included, coming from a point of view. It's just whether or not they tell you. No, I do agree with that, and and that is problematic, because Very. you have to you just have to assume that there's a spin on every pitch. Uh, there there is a spin on every pitch. In today's environment, you write understatement is ignored, exaggeration is discounted, sources are viewed with suspicion, and even well-intentioned advocates deliberately amp up the messaging of impending risks in order to be heard over the cacophony of competing alarms. The result is it is difficult for us to separate the signal of real risk from the noise that bombards us. Page 25 of risk. I go back to January of 2020, General, every single day on this show because I had experience as a commissioner of health in California and I had read the, uh, the great influenza. Every single day I hammered on this and I wasn't alone. A lot of Americans were scared by COVID early on. President did not act until after Matt Pottinger and Robert O'Brien warned him. When he acted, it was immediately politicized, the shutdown of flights from China. After reading risk and after reviewing that, I don't know that we can actually repair the American risk immuniz immunization system. Do you? Well, it's an interesting question because if we went back and said, do a counter historical and had he done differently, how would it have been responded to by the American people? 
I think, as we discussed a little while ago, I think had he communicated very clearly, not just the president, but all the CDC, FDA, all the different players, had protected their uh, credibility, legitimacy, more carefully or more effectively, we should say, then I think that would have helped. But the question is, were the American people ready to accept the kinds of things that history tells us are necessary to get in front of a pandemic? The challenge of a pandemic is leaders have to take very dramatic steps before it's evident to the population because the nature of exponential growth is such that you have to act early or you're chasing it. And the only time it's evident to the people is when you're chasing it, you know, when the problem is big. You know, there's a, uh, a history of leaders making this decision and, and getting on a knife edge and sometimes they, they overreact. Typically they underreact and they just take their chances with some of the previous- Speed is, I, I like your emphasis on speed. I just played some uh, Marty Walsh tape this morning because he's Secretary of Labor now. I think your discussion of his response in Boston was quite revealing, and I'll come back to that in a second. But what is, what is troubling to me is that in any big risk, right now the People's Republic of China is a big risk and terrorism is a big risk, I don't know that there's anyone who commands the field anymore. The way that Walter Cronkite could throw some shade on Vietnam and have everybody's eyebrows go up. To your knowledge, is there anyone like that anymore? Yeah, n nobody that would be that for a wide part of the American people. There are people for certain parts, if you know, in their side or political view, who, who carry great weight. But I cannot think of a single name that that could talk about something and cause everybody to stop and say, "Oh, wait a minute, we need to reconsider." Yeah, this is the biggest warning light about America: is that we couldn't even know if it was coming. Now, about the virus, I want to ask you generally about risk. We had three false positives. SARS, MERS, and Ebola. They all arrived. We dealt with them all or they didn't get to us. Ebola even got to the United States. We dealt with it. Do you think that made the American people complacent about COVID, General? Actually, Hugh, I think it did. I think we started to feel that our public health systems were good enough where we could contain these things better than we actually can. I remember we did a war game when I had first come back from Afghanistan. I was to the joint staff and we did it on smallpox and we it was just a, a one afternoon thing and we came in and we said what if somebody brought smallpox out and many of us most of us aren't vaccinated anymore because smallpox is contained how fast would it move and i remember coming out of that thing just absolutely shocked i don't think the american people appreciate that anymore i i think they have an impression that yeah we can focus on it like as you say ebola sars and whatnot we can contain it and there are times when the only way you can contain it is through very broad dynamic action. And we did not undertake that very broad dynamic action. Uh, Risk, the new book, is uh, if a CEO reads it, a CEO is going to ask himself or herself the question of whether or not my organization needs to do a risk assessment, a risk immunization, a risk immune system assessment. And they might pass it off to a COO or to a CFO to come up with a conversation, et cetera. It should be a trigger for people to ask. Now, my question is, what will they know to study? Because your hypothetical, Virginia Air, fascinating. But it, does that apply to a hospital? Does that apply to a cargo shipment company, to a retailer? How will they know what they ought to run their risk evaluation on, General? Yeah, very interesting. Look at what happened to Southwest Airlines over this past weekend. Yeah. What happened was they essentially found themselves, my assessment, and I don't have all the information yet, is the system started to unravel and they got behind it. And once crews were out of position, they couldn't catch up. And people didn't perceive that they were being honest with people. You know, passengers were frustrated and other people. So this thing has cascaded. I think what we're going to find is because of COVID, as they reduced the size of their force and whatnot, and their capability, and they tried to increase the number of flights, they became more and more vulnerable because their systems were more and more stressed. And so what I would say is most threats have a certain commonality. You have to communicate, you have to get your narrative straight, you have to be able to do decision-making at the right time, all those kinds of things apply to almost any threat. You know, General, you just someone's going to ask whether or not Southwest should run an after action report on this past weekend. For those of you who don't know, 
On Saturday, they canceled 800 flights. On Sunday, they canceled 1,000 flights. I don't know what Monday is bringing as we talk to General McChrystal. I have no idea if they've got it together. The first thing somebody did was lie. The very first thing somebody did was say it's weather related. And, you know, no other airline in the United States is having problems. No one. So it's not weather related. What do you think about that first response, General? You know, we did it a lot in the military, unfortunately. I remember there would be a case where civilians would be killed in Afghanistan. And the first thing the U.S. would say is, we didn't do it. Or it was enemy. And at least stop and say, well, well let us figure it out. Um, because you start in a hole. Once you do that, you just start behind. Now, so uh, how does someone, if you're at Southwest Airlines, because that's in the news, I have no connection to him. I'm, I'm assuming you don't have any connection to him either because you brought him up. How would they go about assembling something to look at this weekend, and why should they do it? Yeah, well, I think they're going to have to do it. Uh, one, because they need to know what happened actually internally. There are going to be a lot of people from the sidelines opining about it so that if they don't know the truth, they're going to be, the narrative is going to be controlled by people from the outside who do that. I think also operationally, there are a number of things that they need to figure out what happened. I was on the board of JetBlue Airlines for a number of years and great organization. But before I had joined the board, the, the founder had lost his job after a snowstorm because the snowstorm cascaded into a number of operational issues. Now, the snowstorm brought it about, but the same sort of vulnerabilities were uncovered when they looked in the organization. Some of the IT systems weren't robust enough and other things, and they had to improve those. So when you get one of these, in many cases, it's an opportunity to say, okay, we now know we got a lot of things we got to work on, and you've got everybody's attention. Hey, we just took a, a real shot here. We, the organization, can use that as impetus to fix it. And so if I were them, I imagine they're doing a hot wash right now. They should do an after action review probably in the next couple of weeks. And then they ought to set themselves up a roadmap for what they're going to, to improve. We have talked about a couple of processes, hot wash and after action report, a couple of the factors on risk assessment. I want to go to one that I think is so vital, narrative. And here you used Google and the Maven project. Now, I'm a fairly harsh critic of Silicon Valley. I know Mark Zuckerberg a little bit. I know Peter Thiel. I, I just think it's a very insular community into which perspectives that are informed by law or military, my specialty and yours, does not easily penetrate. And since they made so much money so fast, there's a tendency to misjudge monetary success with wisdom. Would you talk about what happened with the Maven project and how Google exploded their own narrative and why companies have to be aware of the narrative and indeed the risk that a narrative poses to you? Sure. Starting a narrative is what we say about ourselves. It's the story we want to believe and we want other people to believe. We start that chapter with the story of the Alamo. And remember, the Alamo became a narrative of courage and, and fighting for independence that's far more important than whatever happened in San Antonio in 1836. What happened to Google was, early in its history, they adopted a term, don't be evil, that became their narrative. That was proposed inside the organization, wasn't taken seriously initially. And then over time, it became something that they touted. They put it on banners and whatnot. And it made people feel good about Google. The problem with that narrative was that it was a little bit in the eye of the beholder. People could decide what was evil. And so when the company decided to support the Department of Defense in a project called Project Maven, which involved taking uh, their computer expertise into artificial intelligence and using it to help process information in the Department of Defense, there were people inside Google that perceived that as evil. Now, I would not perceive it that way, but it doesn't matter. Some members of the Google team said that that is in contradiction to our stated goal. I mean, our stated objectives or values of don't be evil. And because it was also in the value set of Google to speak your mind, to be googly as they called it, they started a little rebellion inside of Google. And so what the leadership got themselves, they were on the horns of a dilemma. They were trying to pursue a business relationship with Department of Defense, but they had made this lofty narrative that was out of sync 
with their actual actions. And Google's done some other things in China and whatnot, which certainly can be judged as well. So whenever we have a narrative, it's important that we check that narrative and make sure we're prepared to live it. You know, there's right. a great story in the book about the you know, president in 1957, President, Vice President Nixon goes to Ghana on its Independence Day, and he goes up to a, a, a black man and says, so how does it feel to be free? And the young man goes, I wouldn't know. I'm from Alabama. And that was a case of the American narrative was, and has been for our history, freedom, equality, opportunity, and yet for part of our population in 1957 Alabama, that was aspirational, not real. And so you know, I, I went that. and uh, I had the library staff, I run the Nixon Foundation, I had them look that up after I read it in Risk, and they tell me it's apocryphal, but it's everywhere, so don't yell at the general. So it, it, Nixon said it never happened, but it's everywhere, so I'm not supposed to yell at you according to my library staff. I want to talk to you about structure, general, because risk officers exist in a lot of organizations. I had no idea that all the risk officers were purposefully avoided at Lehman prior to the collapse of 08. They were being excluded from meetings about risk. Yeah, it's kind of like not bringing the lawyer in the room when you don't want somebody who's going to rain on your parade. And so they made this habit of making decisions. And of course, you make more money if you take more risk in finances until you don't. And yeah. so they, they basically kept the risk officers out of touch. There's something also involved we discuss moral licensing, where if you have a risk officer, you're doing your thing and someone says, well, this could be risky. And you say, well, I don't need to worry about that because I got a risk officer. They're worried about that. She can spend sleepless nights. She'll stop me. But if you allow the structure to prevent them from doing their job, you got a problem. Have you, um, are you a reader of the Better Letter by RPC, right, General? He's, he's a, a world-class investment manager. I know him a little bit, but not well. But he writes about bias all the time. All the time he writes about bias. On page 123 of risk is your symptoms of common tops of biases. Information sampling bias, confirmation bias, which is just everywhere, the halo effect, status quo bias, hindsight bias, planned continuation bias, and in-group bias. If for no other reason, people ought to buy uh, risk to read that chart again. The, the kind of bias I'm talking about in Silicon Valley at Google it comes from insularity, General. Do you know what I'm, do you, do you sense it's there? Do you think it's there the way I do? Absolutely there. I think it's in other places as well. You know, we think of bias. If you use the word bias to me, I think of racism. And I say, well, I'm not racist, so I, I don't have biases. I have a ton of biases, and so do you. And organizations like that, they get insular, and they start to see the world in a common view. And not only do they are they biased, but because they lack diversity on different views, people pumping fresh air in there, they can make really bad judgments. Yeah, they, it's, it's a great antidote for being uh, isolated right now. We're running low on time, so I want to talk to you about the military and Afghanistan in general in the context of risk, your new book. Um, do members of the military, you say that they have a systemic and deep bias against violence, uh, against war, and I understand that being a civilian around members of the military. I understand that. That will surprise a lot of people, though. Do you want to expand on that before I proceed? Yeah, I mean, there are two parts of that. The first part is that warriors want to fight, not just because they people say it's because of their careers. That's not it. You know, baseball players want to play baseball. Warriors want to go to war because that's how you convince yourself that you're really a warrior. The problem is you want to go to war once and then you learn you don't want to go to war again. You know, you, you figure that out pretty quickly. And so the cost of war is just too high for warriors to be big proponents of it. Now, so, General, my two, my two questions about the Pentagon, one has to do with Afghanistan, one has to do with culture. I have noticed that the military is very decisive when mistakes are made. In fact, I've sometimes thought punitive action are taken against both Army, Navy, Marine Corps officers when mistakes happen. Is that the culture of the military and it's just always going to be that way? Almost a zero uh, a, a, a tolerance for error of a, any kind of consequence? Yeah, he actually, during my career, it was. And I think it's still more than is healthy 
uh, is. In my career, if a, an officer, for example, got one ding on his career, did one thing that was a nick, you would not be selected for command, you would not be promoted. And what that does, it's kind of insidious. It creates a culture of avoiding anything that gets you scuffed up at all, making controversial decisions, doing something. Now, there's a goodness to that. You don't want people off doing weird stuff. At the same time, we all learn. I've done a bunch of dumb things in my life, and the reality is, hopefully, I learn from those. And I think the military went overboard to be risk averse for that kind of leader and leadership. Right. And I think it's just. I, I agree. I also loved your story about Patton bringing forward a lot of Patton wannabes. I understand lots of problems occur in the military culture, but boy, the, the zero tolerance for error must rob the military of great talent. Now I want to talk to you about Afghanistan, General, because you're in a position to judge risks better than almost anyone with whom I've talked. Now that we know the conclusion of it, how high do you judge the risk of any terrorist group, no matter whether we call them ISIS-K, Al-Qaeda, or a Taliban Group C? How great is the risk of one reforming and putting roots down in Afghanistan? I think the potential of somebody trying to do that is pretty high. I think the risk from it is not that high to be honest, because they could go anywhere. I mean, to be honest, a, a terrorist group now could go to Columbus, Ohio, and form themselves and do great damage from there, whether they were Americans or not. And so the point is, I don't think that this skyrockets our risk from that particular threat. Let me, no, let me follow up on why I, I'm surprised by that answer. In the 20 years since 9-11, Afghanistan has been the subject of a huge infusion of capital, a huge infusion of violence, and a huge infusion of technology. The uh, ambassador from Afghanistan to the United States told me after the fall of the country that there were 20 million cell phones there that weren't there 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years of women have been educated that weren't educated 20 years ago. It's a very different place. Do they have better capabilities at their disposal now, general, particularly when it comes to biohazard? Well. I think so, but remember, there are two separate things here. The Afghan people and what's happened in Afghan society is separate. They've never been an international threat. They never had that aspiration. It was foreign terrorists, Al-Qaeda, that used Karnak farms in parts of Afghanistan as a safe haven, a sanctuary to operate out from. And so I don't think the Afghans are a threat to us. I think a foreign terrorist group there could be a threat. but. As I say, I don't think it's any higher than it would be from the Horn of Africa or somewhere else. And we just got to deal with that. Now, my friend John Andrasik, who's Group 5 for Fighting, has been touring, has been connecting with a lot of Afghan veterans. You are one yourself, who feel loss and betrayal. And he has a song, which is very controversial, Blood on My Hands, which is very, very harsh on the administration, on anyone involved. What do you think, what do you think about what happened? You who commanded every, every American, every NATO member in Afghanistan, what do you think about what happened? Yeah, I'm going to be very direct on this. I hope that veterans don't take that loss and betrayal narrative. Uh, I think that that is a little bit of a, a victimization of us that isn't going to be helping. It's a little happened after Vietnam and you have the stabbed in the back theory and whatnot, and I really don't sign up for it. Um, I think Afghanistan was a failure, and I think it was a failure of lots of things. And some of that failure comes on my doorstep, some of that failure comes on other military, and some goes on policymakers and whatnot. What we have to do is recognize, my experience was that it was largely good people with good intentions working hard, trying to get a good outcome, and we didn't. And that ought to give us pause, because if there was one stupid person or one evil person or something like that, you could pin it on them, okay, no problem. But we can't, in my view. We ought to be looking hard and say, if we do our best and can't do it, we need to look at how we do things differently in the future. The second thing I think is, we gave Afghanistan 20 years. We went there and for 20 years, we fought alongside them. In many cases, carried the brunt of the fighting. We put a lot of money in there. We got women to school and whatnot. And while I would have left a force there, to be quite honest, you know, the Afghans had 20 years to get their act together and to fight, and they didn't do that. And they, 70,000 Taliban, aren't particularly popular, never have been, were able to topple the government. 
And so a good amount of the responsibility rests with the Afghans as well. So I think so we just that. So, so after Vietnam, which I'm glad you brought up, there was a no more Vietnam slogan. Now we already hear no more Afghanistans, which I, I think means a lot depending on who the audience is and a communication strategy is there. What ought the military specifically to do in the aftermath of a 20-year campaign that ends in failure? Yeah, we ought to study what we did wrong, but I think you can't just study the military because this was a political, geopolitical failure, really. When someone says no more Afghanistans, I go, what do you mean? You know, some people say no nation building, no long-term commitments, no whatever. And I think that that's a mistake. You know, what are we trying to do with the world? We're trying to build alliances. We're trying to have global influence. We're trying to do all the things that would be good for the United States of America. And sometimes it involves helping a nation who's a potential ally build itself up. And we just got to do it better. Now, we got to make decisions on which ones are worth it and which ones aren't worth it. But any simplistic thing that says no more uh, Afghanistans, I think, is really dangerous. It is. I, I agree. President Nixon used to define progress as the ongoing incremental expansion of liberty and literacy in a growing number of nations allied with a stable West. By that metric, which has always made sense to me, we've gone backwards in the last year pretty dramatically. And we may be going backwards even more. And we have to arrest that. I think risk is partially directed towards arresting that. If I can talk specifically about the Pentagon in conclusion, we mentioned Google. Right now, Washington, D.C., where I'm talking to you from, and you're in a different part of the Beltway, um, is overwhelmed with lobbyists from Silicon Valley, which you talk about at length in, in the book Risk. And the United States military has got, I think the chairman's office has got two members of staff on the Hill the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, Marine Corps, they each have legislative fellows and things like that, but they're like overwhelmed by Silicon Valley. Do you think the military, without becoming political, has to get smarter about politics? Well, that's a great question, you. I mean, part of me, my heart says no. We ought to step away from him. We ought to be Samuel Huntington, soldier in the state, technocrats, but that's not realistic either. The problem is if you get too savvy politically, you start thinking of yourself that way. You start trying to be a political operative. And, and I see it in military leaders. There's this uh, gravitational pull to getting involved in it. And then once you're getting involved in it, you think you're kind of clever and you, you spend something to get better uh, resources for your service or to get some outcome and you justify to yourself that it's for the greater good. The problem is when our military gets too far, it's not for the greater good. It's not for the greater good of the military, and it's not for the greater good of the nation. So we've got to find some way to have the military not be ignorant in dealing with politics, but, but so, still let, above it. Last question, gentlemen. Crystal, you've been very generous with your time, and I appreciate it. It'll make a great podcast. People need to go out and get risk. It's about risk. Who is the person who needs this most who is least likely to think that they need it? Yeah, I think anybody who's been successful for a long time and has been in front of the parade, I think they ought to read that book and they ought to be listening to the people behind them. You know, in general, that is so what I hoped you'd say. I have one more bonus question. You know, it is generally reported that senior officers of the military did not much like President Trump. And I don't want your opinion on President Trump. I want to take that as a given that he was generally held in low regard by general officers in the military. There's obviously a bell curve with everything. Do you think that comes from the fact that the military exists so much on an evaluation system? You get a fit rep at least once a year and sometimes twice a year in the military. And if you're not doing well on a fit rep, you're never going to be a general officer. And if you're doing too really well, you're never going to be you or Stav or Mattis or any of these guys. Whereas Donald Trump became the commander in chief of the military without ever having had a fit rep that wasn't backed up by the free market, we have a bankruptcy parachute. You can always declare under the rule of law bankruptcy and get away. Do you think that's the disconnect between the cultures, always responsible, never accountable? No, I don't think that's what it was. Um, and one, I don't know, because I've asked a lot of people what his relative popularity was, because you go back 
President Obama never got a Fed rep. President Biden never got a I mean, most of those guys grew up in a political world that is pretty different from what the military grew up with. So there's this sort of fascination, but, you know, uh, separation. I think uh, if there's any opinion, it's more that President Trump's demeanor and his style are very antithetical to what military believes theirs, ours should be in terms of physical fitness and honesty and, and straightforwardness. He seemed at odds with many of the sort of traditional normative behaviors of a leader. Now, part of that's what made him popular. But you know, the military is a pretty conservative organization, not conservative politically, but conservative in, in how you act and whatnot. And, and my guess is that's the, the greater cause. Well, you know, interesting, General, I'm going to push back. A bit. I think you just agreed with me. Because every single fit rep that someone ever wrote about Stanley McChrystal, including your mentor who told you about the dog not getting fed, and I'm going to finish with that, would have had fitness, character, decency, honesty as values by which your promotion would be controlled. So while fit rep is shorthand for what you just said, it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I didn't define it that way. But, but I think you're right. Those, those values and behaviors that make you successful in the military were very different from those which Donald Trump exhibited. Let, let me talk to you about your mentor, because I want everyone to hear this going out the door. If it's three people's responsibility to feed the dog, the dog is going to starve. I'm, not, that, I'm taking that and putting it on, on the shelf somewhere. Explain who told you that and why it's true. Yeah, I worked for many years of my career for a guy who retired as Lieutenant General John Barnes. And he's an Alabama boy, played at Alabama football and whatnot. But he could always boil things down to the simplest, most clear conclusion possible. And he always said, somebody's got to be responsible. And we've got to have one throat to choke if it doesn't go well. So we've got to identify what that is. <laughs> one throat to choke is not in the book, but if three people are responsible for feeding the dog, yes, the dog will starve. General Stanley McChrystal, congratulations and to Anna as well. Risk is a great book, a wonderful read, a necessary read. Congratulations on another bestseller. Thanks so much, Hugh. Thank you, General.